You don't run out. You don't have to change the, the film. Film? <laughs> we got old school film gear right here. Let me just turn this off. I love okay. you, Bill. This will be a fun podcast for sure. Okay. Well, I've been thinking about it a lot, Mark. And so Yeah, why have you been thinking about it so much? Okay. Well, just being self-conscious, you know. And like I say, once it's down, like the, there for the world. Yeah, I mean it's hard, right? You're telling your life story. Yeah. You know, it's something to leave for your family. Yeah, and it's important to you. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. It's like, you know, like everybody has their own story. You know, it's like we all look out of our le- our own eyes as our lens to the world. Right. And each person has their own lens of how they perceive things. Yeah, they do. Um, we have these stories. This is why I do this, mm-hmm. is I know that individuals like you have these amazing stories. Sometimes I'm a part of these stories, sometimes I'm not, mm-hmm. but it helps me understand why I do what I do and why I did what I did, yeah. because I think we kind of all follow the same rhythm of why we did it. Don't you think? I mean, there's a, there's a rhythm of why you love Native arts. Yeah, well, I think uh, how art is just, how we all, Maybe art resonates how important it is in our lives throughout culture forever. It's sort of yeah. Been, and um, I think art also, um, not only does art express beauty, but it can express angst. It's a way, oh, yeah. it's a way to, you know, to get out things, you know. Absolutely. So, um, you know, it, it encompasses so much, you know. Well, so let's just kind of start from the beginning because you're yeah. one of the rare individuals, I think, that has this interesting backstory of living on the res and being part of the Navajo world and Hopi world at a very young age. And so that gives you a, neat, a very unique um, insight, I think, to not only the people, but probably the art, the culture that maybe other um, Native American dealers haven't had or had to get at secondary. But when you grow up with it, it's a different thing. So, yeah, tell me, where did you, where were you born? So I'll just give you my, I'll, we'll, like I said, we'll put all the pieces together. <laughs> so I was, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. And when I was 22 it's months very old. Navajo. Yeah. It's very Navajo. Yeah. Very Navajo. Yeah. It, uh, uh-huh. uh, born in Brooklyn, New York, where a lot of people were born. And um, I, w- I was 22 months old. I was still in diapers. And my parents, and with my two older brothers, got in a woody, and we drove across the country. And like so many people, it was the uh, early 50s or mid-50s. And um, my mother was following her first cousin who moved to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And then my uncles came. I don't know the order, but... A lot of people were migrating from the East Coast to the West Coast. And Los Angeles was a place a lot of people were moving to. You know, it was the end of the war and GI Bill and homes and right. tracking. So we moved from Brooklyn, New York to the San Fernando Valley. Was there a reason, though? I mean, was it just to follow the, your mother's sister or was it there's a job opportunity or why does she go to L.A.? Yeah, um, mainly um, I, think, um, I think it was probably for new opportunities. And um, my uh, my mother uh, didn't have two two brothers, and um, but she followed our cousin her cousin her, uh, Herb, who was in the film industry. I see. And so he he was in New York and did Playhouse ninety, and which most people don't know what that. I've is. I've actually heard of it, but yeah, don't but, know much. But, but I've heard of it. But so, but you'll see what I'm getting out for you. So anyway, uh, Herb moved out here, and he was a producer and a director. And my family moved out, and we moved to the San Fernando Valley, and. Um, but uh, and the, uh, so we had some family in the industry, in the entertainment industry, and Herb um, was a producer and director. And the reason I bring him up is because one of the movies he made, um, the, the actor had just passed away just recently, Sidney Poitnay, and he did a movie called Mr. Tibbs. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. That was his movie. Oh. And then that was your um, my, my, my mother's first cousin, oh, yeah, wow. Herbert Hirschman. And then Herb did, and I remember when I was a little kid, I went down to the set, and Herb uh, did a TV show called Perry Mason. Yeah, of course. And then, uh, and I remember watching it on TV. I'm mean, going to the set, seeing, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, Raymond Burr and, right. and all that. But the reason I bring it up, he had, did another TV show, which you might relate to, is he did Dr. Kildare. Yeah. Which I actually yeah. like Perry Mason better. Right. And it was in my... Last book, I actually did a whole oh. thing on Perry Mason. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, and then, <laughs> but I did like Dr. Kildare. Yeah. Well, he's being a doctor, yeah. ex-doctor. Yeah. And uh, and then another, my mother's other cousin married a fellow named Jack Ozark, and um, Jack was an animator. 
So Jack did uh, like Betty Aboop and Popeye. Oh, yeah. He worked with Disney. And then Jack, um, this is the old days, the old school. He was an animator. He, he you know, made the, and then he worked for Hanna-Barbera. And um, one of the uh, main shows he did, which is really cool, he did Jetsons. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. And then I think he did the Flintstones too. So he did I mean, animation. He, animator, totally animator. And Ellen, his his daughter, who's a friend of mine, lives near, very near me, has all the cells and you know oh, wow. all that stuff. So uh, you know, uh, being in Los Angeles, uh, so I'm we moved to the San Fernando Valley, and I had two older brothers, which influenced my life a lot. I'm the third, and uh, so we lived there in the valley, and it was really actually a nice place to grow up. Uh, I lived in a in a tracking development and you know um at that point people were migrating from everywhere to los angeles right and the biggest building in, da in los angeles at that time was city hall mm. which is a small building now right that, when i moved to la it was literally city hall was the biggest building and what um, years were these basically uh, it would have been 1955 about? is when we got there i was born in 53 so okay. 55 or 54 i guess we yeah. moved there and then um so it was so we had like orange groves at the end of the block, um, and uh, and it was just a tracking development. And but my neighbors, my next door neighbor was from Pennsylvania, across the street from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. My other next door neighbor, he he was from Beirut, and his wife was from Paris. I mean, it was just a mix mosh of everybody in the world. It was so right. great, the diversity of where you know where I lived, it right. was, which uh, made it to me very rich. And at the end, and this is Southern California, so at the end of the tracking development was an old abandoned orange grove. And on the other side were these old little ranchettes. And then on the way to the market where we would walk is a Japanese strawberry grower dro yeah. uh, growing strawberries. Right. And then on my way to elementary school, um, right across the street from my elementary school where I would walk was uh, Chuck Connor's house, the rifleman. Right. He lived right across the street from the from uh, my elementary school. And then I, my day camp, I would go out to Chatsworth and we my day camp and there was a little uh, reservoir there and we used to watch them film Lassie. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. I mean, that's like, you know. So you had this influence early on in the arts and cinematography and things like that. Yeah, just pe creative people. Yeah. And then. Um, Were you ever cons think, oh, maybe this is a route for me. It's obviously no, worked for my uh, r relatives and they've yeah. been very successful. No, not, no, not, not really. I, I don't know. It wasn't maybe my calling. Were you interested in native arts at this point yet? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Whenever we played Cowboys and Indians, I was always an Indian. Mm. And I was fascinated. I'd make like, you know, when you're a little kid, you know, you're making little, I'd make villages and huts and all that, but right. I, I'm not sure why. But um, uh, so, so here we are in the San Fernando Valley, and my grandmother lived in uh, City Terrace, Boyle Heights, which mm -hmm. is East LA, mm -hmm. and she lived there. And my father and mother, who are a product of the Depression, they loved to go shopping in thrift shops. That was like something, you know, they did. They just right. enjoyed doing it, thrift shop hunting. So we're in uh, City Terrace of Boyle Heights, and I go into this thrift shop with my parents, the three of us, and on the floor, on the ground, were three unframed, small little 12 by 16 oil paintings or whatever. And one was of the Grand Canyon, the other one was Canyon de Chez, and the other one was Monument Valley. Yeah. And I looked at these three paintings on the floor, and it's just out of the way there, and I looked at them, and I just told my parents, I said, I really want to buy these paintings. And so they asked the person, and they said, well, they're 10 cents each. So I bought these three paintings for 30 cents, took them home. My parents found some frames for them, which are still on them, the right. original, the frames they found. But the real story of this that I'm getting at was that here, well, first of all, why is a six-year-old buying some oil paintings? That, I, I don't understand that. I still don't really. Yeah. But I was attracted to them, and I bought them. But the kicker of the story is literally 11 years later, after I bought this painting in my valley, my parents moved to right there. To that area. Right to that area, basically. And why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I mean, it's still, I mean, I, I think it's a really cool story. I don't know actually why I was attracted to him. But um, why we did, had, but we why had did a lot they... of artists in our family, filmmakers. Yeah. Um, I had a cousin who she painted in a, a w, uh, during the WPA period. Mm -hmm. She worked with Diego R Rivera at the Rockefeller Center. She painted murals with Diego Rivera, my and, mother's cousin. Oh, that's and interesting. I, we had, I had a cousin who lived in the village in New York and was part of the whole scene. Uh, Auden, the poet Auden, right. his lover was my m mother's cousin. So I, I have, a, on my mother's side, a lot of very creative people. My grandfather was an engineer, and uh, he uh, uh, built the Holland Tunnel. Mm. Um, 
So these paintings that you have, mm-hmm. that you had framed, so did they stay in your, you hung them up on your, on uh, your wall? Uh, they stayed somehow in the, my family possession. Did you Even have them in your room or did you, were they in uh, the... You know, again, I don't know, we just, maybe they put aside, I, I somehow I held on to them. Yeah. So, and we, they've made, my parents made a couple major moves and somehow they were still held on to. And I wasn't holding on to them, but they were still held on and, um, you know, I, I have them to this day. And you're six at that time. I was six years right. old. So this is 1958? Yeah, well, 53 and 6, 50, so 59. 59, okay. And so at what point in this, and you leave 12 years later to Monument Valley is when they moved? No, so... When did uh, they move to Monument Valley? So they moved in 1970. So um, so the back up with my... So I grew up in the San Valley, great place to grow up. Yeah. You know, um, everyone who grew up in the valley wants to get out of the valley. You know, they, everybody leaves. They go to the Bay Area. They go to yeah. Colorado, Oregon, whatever. Yeah. That I, I'm a product of the 60s. I had yeah. two older brothers. My oldest brother went to UCLA. He moved to Venice Beach. I went. I started, uh, when I was a little kid, uh, my mother loved to camp. So when I was a little kid, we I grew up camping in Kings Canyon. And they were part of a hiking group, a German hiking group. And they had a cabin up in San Jacinto. And it was truly, you know, a wood burning stoves, kerosene lamps. Mm-hmm. I mean, totally, you had to hike in to bring in your food. And I grew up around nature a lot. We camped in Kings Canyon. My brothers would go backpacking, and I'd stay with my mother because I was a little kid. Um, but I grew up around nature. Uh, 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 There's real affinity towards nature. Um, uh, when uh, the beach we used to play, go to when I was a little boy was Zuma Beach in Malibu. Mm-hmm. We'd we'd go to right. Zuma Beach or Ocean Park, which is uh, where POP was and. What's and, POP? Uh, that was uh, Pacific Ocean Park. It was now it's now burnt <laughs> down, turned down, but it was. See, that's a real California. Yeah, oh, it POP. Was a, what do you mean? Roller coaster. They didn't right. grew up in Southern California. Right, P- right. Uh, you know, uh, it finally fell and apart. But. Do you remember your first trip out to the the reservation? I, I actually do. So um, when I was sixteen, not not really the reservation. I remember the Southwest. My first trip. So while well, I was a teenager, um, my brothers, again, having older brothers, my parents would kind of, the third one, they kind of let go of me. Right. And this is a, a, the 60s, and I was hitchhiking at a young age, up 101, back and forth to the Bay Area and back and mm-hmm. forth. And uh, when I was 16, um, I left Los Angeles uh, and mo- was going to go to a school in Bellingham, Washington. Mm-hmm. And I was 16, and we took the th- three other men, teenagers, myself, we, ha- we had this uh truck and we left Los Angeles and we actually via went through the Grand Canyon to go to Bellingham, Washington. And I, that was my first really exposure that I remember of the Southwest. In fact, we hiked the Grand Canyon. When we hiked it, we went down and started raining. When we went down, we slept the night at the bottom. We came back up, halfway back up, it was snow. We, mm-hmm. It was four feet of snow by the time we got to the rim because we mm-hmm. were there in the right. winter time. And this is 1969, you're uh, like 16? This would have been uh, probably uh, 19, around 1969, yeah. somewhere right around there. So I was thinking, don't quote me on any dates exactly because I can be off by six months, <laughs> but based roughly around there. Right. right. And then prior you, to that, were your brothers involved in Vietnam? Because you know they're older and that's yeah. sixty nine, and you're yeah. sixteen, so yeah. they're, they're of that time frame. Yeah, they were. Um, my brother, um, not to get too heavily into uh, politics, and I'm a real supporter of the our, uh, of our soldiers in the armed service. I'm a supporter of that. Right. You know, it's politicians who put us into war, not as as as, as I told someone this morning. It's the old it, old men send young men to die. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's basically you yeah, know, war, true. whatever back to forever history. Yeah. So uh, my uh, that and also unfortunately uh, wars when you have a a country that if the population really does not want you there for whatever reasons whatever reasons you're going there for your good will to, to bring democracy if the population does not want you there you're not going to win. Yeah, you just you're not going to win. Yeah, I don't care what culture philosophies, whatever, if the people don't want you there, inevitably you will lose. So um, we could go down that path. It's a really long story. I, I, I'd be well, happy to tell you, but... Yeah, the interesting thing about it is, I, you know, and I bring this up a lot in, in, my, in these interviews, is because I think there's a relationship to how we see the world through that war of our generation, yeah, our that, generation. that helps other people understand. Plus, you know, in that time frame, that's really when native arts, in my opinion, really just kind of exploded. Yeah. And, you know, and I think some of that's tied to the music. 
yeah. uh, as well. Yeah, well, Jim Morrison wearing his concho belt. Yeah, his first phase and, concho belt stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, let's go down that, that road if you want to. Well, I, I'll share it with you. Yeah, yeah, no, it'd be interesting. Okay. Well, it's so, what, it's, it affected you, I yeah. have no doubt, and yes, made you who you are. Yes, it's part of who I am. Yeah, so. So, my brother's going to UCLA. It's the, the war. And, uh, I, again, I'm a supporter of our armed I support... I mean, you know, if it was World War II, I would have fought. Th I would have gone and fought fascism. Sure, um, I get it. But um, and I believe in protecting my family. And if someone's going to come kill my family, I'm, you know, it's me or you, you know. But but war gets politics, you know. And so um, World War II was a different story. After that, we can get into all kinds of philosophy. So I'm um, saying that um, being Vietnam and the war, um, when I was 14 years old, um, I went for two years, when I was 14, 15, I actually went to this uh, Institute for the Study of Nonviolence in Carmel Valley that uh, a man named uh, Ira Sam Pearl, David Harris, and John Baez founded mm. in Carmel Valley. Mm. And, um, and it was a small little institute that people from all over the world came to study um, about nonviolence. Mm. And Ira Samperl, who is sort of my mentor, and I'm pretty young, a teenager, he went to jail with Martin Luther King many times. And so um, Ira was sort of my mentor, and um, I got to know Joan and her family, her mother and dad, and her, her, her aunt Tina. And, and so I went to the institute and I'd learn about um, Sagagraha, which is Hindi for nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe. Um, if you want real, true, healthy, holistic change, you have to do it non-violently. Non and that's what Gandhi did in India. He, he took down the British Empire, not with guns, but right. by boycotting the salt. And, you know, he, he did it, tried to do it in a spiritual way. Right. And um, he was successful. He took down the British Empire by refusing to you know, do that. So, so at 14, so you've at gone 14, to this. At 14, I'm, I'm doing and, this. And that's a very... Uh, malleable time for people to really make their see the world in a new way that yeah. may stick forever really. yeah and uh, you know knowing Joan um, I got I mean I was, I was real young but I was right there with the music scene I went to the Big Sur Folk Festival twice where everybody in the world there were like 800 people it was at Eswan Institute yeah. there's a swimming pool there's stage the swimming pool and then there were like 600 yeah. 600 people <laughs> that sounds great and everybody was there yeah. I mean there wasn't a, it was Woodstock but on mini Woodstock right. Everybody was there. And I went there, you know, it was small. So, you know, it was, you know, I, you know everybody was there. So it was fun. And I, I, um, I, at this point, I spent a lot of time in Venice. Yeah. Um, my brother was going to school at UCLA. So Venice was sort of the, the village. Venice is, was really the, was the first beatniks. It was the Greenwich Village with beatniks. Yeah. And in the 60s, the hippies came in, and the doors lived in the Venice canals. And... You know, they had the Cheetah Club, and I used to watch Can Heat play at the Pavilion. And then the boardwalk at that point was nothing but old Jews and and college students yeah. by the thousands. You know, this is when people were roller skating, but it was pre, you know, the tourist spot, international tourist spot. It was just a happening scene. Right. My, uh, my very first rent when I moved there later was $90 a month. You know? yeah. That's where Tony Berlant had his studio. Frank Gehry, everyone was there because it was cheap. It yeah. was just like... And being, they're creative. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it was a very creative community, Venice. So your brother's in college. My brother's I'm, in college. I'm young. I um, at I went to a school called Summerhill. Uh, uh, it was based on Summerhill in England, which was started by a man named A.S. Neal, which was a progressive school uh, teaching. And so they started a school in California based on Summerhill in England. I went to that, and actually, it's it, sort of, it was in the valley, and it sort of split, and one half went to, um, at that point, point was West Washington Boulevard, which is now Abbott Kinney in Venice, mm -hmm. Abbott Kinney Street. Um, and so I had, a, they, we were in a, in a little um, craftsman home and that was my schoolhouse. And there were about 15 students and four or five teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, it was this craftsman house. We used to go to the Venice Canals and took, uh, did the, uh, black and white photography and we had a little dark room in this house. And behind this house were all these giant um, uh, wooden crates filled and we used to play on them. And inside these wooden crates were a castle that William Randolph Hearst bought. And they were stored in our backyard, this castle. And they're all stacked up. We're going to be playing on them. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm 15 years old, 14 years old at this point. Right. Then I, um, I, well, I, come, I go back to the valley. And my parents said, you got to go to, back to high school from this school. And, and so I go to San Fernando High School uh, for a year. And um, this is in the late 60s. Um, a lot of stuff's going down in L.A., 
really major stuff going on. And it was a great experience there. And I, I grew up swimming. I was on a swim club since I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. I was a swimmer, we were surfing. My family was very athletic. Ten, I grew up, we played tennis every Sunday right. morning. So from San Fernando, I spent a year there. Uh, L.A. was burning, so I said, I, I need to leave Los Angeles. So I went to Bellingham, Washington. I just still want to get back to your brother, though. It's back to my brother? Yeah, because oh. we passed that up. Oh, okay. Because he's in school he's in, in Vietnam yeah. War. So he was against the war. He got, uh, but a lot of people were, uh, there was a draft resistance. People were going to prison, uh, going to the war or going to prison. Right. Uh, David Harris, um, a lot of people, a lot of friends went to prison. Um, in fact, we had a thing called the Medicine Show where we, out at Safford prison, a lot of people were sent to Safford prison here. Mm. And um, we had a thing called the Medicine Show and about four or five school buses and 20 vans and they all drive out to Safford right. and play music and, and all the prisoners would be on one side of the fence and there'd be 50 people on their side entertaining them. And so my, uh, they, uh, so my brother um, uh, didn't register. He did get arrested. He had to go to jail and um, actually the judge let, uh, let him off. There were people who um, um, he, he resisted and the judge let him go. Was he, he didn't go to prison, um, but many of our friends did go to prison. Was he a conscientious objector? Basically, yeah. And they, so they let him up. And so he's, how much older is he? He's than nine years older than me. Nine, okay. And I have a middle brother who was about six years older. And did he have to deal with that too? Uh, no, he didn't have to deal with that. He had a whole other circumstance. And that brother was an amazing man. and um, He could fix anything. He, mm. he was one of these guys. In fact, when I, we were teenagers, we were interested in bees, and he started we used to go collect the wild swarms of bees. Mm. And he was in the kind of, everybody at that point would bring the farming, growing your own food. You know, it was the 60s. Yeah, no, so, it is. Uh, and you're very much into music at that point yeah, too, clearly. Yeah, yeah, I started playing a little bit. Yeah, like, you're a good guitar stuff. player. I, I enjoy it, it's yeah. important for me. Yeah, you're and, a good guitar player, yeah, I heard you. you. And then I, it, it's part of my life and I'm yeah. grateful about that. And I get, we could talk about it a little bit more, but later. Uh, but my middle brother, also an amazing person, he cut, he, he became very religious, but he kind of walked the talk. And my middle brother, which is a very tragic thing, he um, was in uh, Rwanda. My, my sister-in-law is amazing, uh, amazing person. And my brother, right after the Hutu Tutsi mass, uh, right, mass uh, genocide, yeah. my brother was there and he was helping the Tutsis coming back in from the Congo, mm. back into Rwanda. Mm. And he was on a plane with the leaders of Rwanda and it crashed and he was killed at 50. Mm. Uh, and um, quite tragic for my parents, yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, he walked the talk, though. He was an incredible person. Yeah. My sister-in-law, Gila, who uh, has a home in northern Israel uh, near Tiberias. Uh, she goes, she's right now in India. She works with the untouchables for oh, yeah. schooling. Yeah. And then she goes to the Eastern Congo. She's been going there ever since my brother died. And um, the government in the Congo gave her 1,200 hectares of land. And she started this community for women who've been um, uh, raped right. and uh, women who's lost their husbands. And she started this whole community in Eastern Congo to uh, teach uh, trades. Wow. And so she's been teaching uh, people trades and she's been going in and out of the Congo. And when there's guerrilla war going around them and the UN's come in there and they'll fly her out on a helicopter because it's, it's too dangerous to be there. Yeah. She's the only white woman there. Everyone else is African. <laughs> and uh, But she walks to talk too. And she's right now in India. She's uh, she's written a book about the Congo. Yeah. And so that's my brother, that my middle brother's family, and well, that's that's a whole other story. There's a whole bunch of stories. But that says a lot about your family. I can see the th the thread there. Yeah, right there from your older brother. Yeah, and my other brother. brother's very involved with the Kurds, uh, and he goes to the Middle East quite a bit. He's writing his autobiography, and he's been, he knows the ministers of the Kurds, and he's been very involved with the Kurdish people who have been like trampled for you know they're like yeah. been surrounded, and uh, so and that's the nine year old brother. Yeah, right he's my yeah. older brother. Okay, so now I understand. That's good. So I understand how you you know you fit into my this mother time fought thing. for social security and was arrested like thirteen times. My mother actually, uh -huh. my mother was an my mother was an engineer and a mathematician. And yes. she did not know it, but she worked on the Manhattan Project. Oh, that's interesting. She did not know it, you know, because no one knew it was top secret. But they did tell her, well, you're one of the first women to be working on this. If you do a good job, we will hire other women. And where was she doing In that? New York. She New was York. in Brooklyn. Yeah, she was in New York City. Yeah, or wherever, you know. interesting. Yeah, she wasn't in... And you know. what did your dad do? He was just, he just was raising three sons and he um, uh, worked for Lockheed, you know. And he, he, I had very, I was a very fortunate person. I had really loving parents. 
And I honestly believe this, that um, if the, the beginning, if you have loving, caring parents, that's the foundation yeah. for everybody and anybody. If you have that, you're fortunate, you're already ahead of the game. If you have people who love you, you're ahead of the game. Yeah. And I, I had that. I'm very fortunate. And I told the brothers, you know, we would get mixed it up. And, you know, I mean, they, you know, but it was a very close family in that. We all kind of played together. Yeah. And, uh, but my parents were really, really wonderful. So he just worked raising a family, but he, he always wanted to be a writer, but, you know, he couldn't do that. He had kids and all right. that. So he, but he went back to school and got his degree, his teaching degree, mm. which will explain why, how I get up, get to where I get. But so I'm 16. I want to get out of LA. I moved to Bellingham, Washington. I'm, uh, I am, uh, I go, I'm living in the Cascades, literally in the middle of the Cascades on a cattle ranch mm -hmm. on the Canadian border. Like you'd watch the Canadian border police go by where I was and right. we had cows and I drove tractors. And then I went back into Bellingham and I lived in a log cabin in, in, a ra in the rainforest on Chuckanut Drive. You had to hike two miles to get to this rainforest and we had a wood burning stove, kerosene lamps. And was uh, it just you or did no, you go No, there's four of us yeah. in there. And eventually they all left and I had me and my me and my dog lived in there by by myself. And so this was on Georgia Pacific land. And I was living there and studying and um one night in the middle of the night at midnight. And this is like literally there was an old lumber road that you couldn't you couldn't drive up. And all of a sudden at midnight and I'm by myself, you hear I hear these vehicles and all of a sudden there's like five pickup trucks in front of my log cabin with their headlights on and these guys I don't know whether they yelled or bullhorn and so who's in there? You, this is Georgia Pacific land and you have to get out of here. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm freaking out. It's midnight. I'm by myself in this cabin. And it was Georgia Pacific coming to kick me off the, out of there. This was a, a lumberjack's cabin I originally. Right. And they kicked me off the land. So I, I left. I got out of there. Lived in Bellingham. While I was living in down old in the old Bellingham, um, I built this a ship lot lap. I got an old Dodge flat uh, truck, a yeah. uh, flatbed. And I built this ship lap cabin on it with Dutch doors and a pot belly stove. And at this point, my parents had moved to Denahozo, Arizona to teach school because my father was too old to be able to teach in, uh, in Los Angeles. My mother was an adventurer. And so she said, well, let's, let's move to the Navajo Reservation. And uh, my parents have always through their whole life have tried to help other people. And yeah. So my parents moved to Denahozo. Now, uh, our listeners here, <laughs> few people, I know you know where Denahoto is. Most people don't know where Denahoto is. But at what, uh, Denahoto is 28 miles outside of Kayanta on 160. Yeah. And Kayanta at one time was the, the furthest farthest. post office, yeah. in, excuse me, in continental America. That's right. It, it was. was the furthest post office. Yeah. And they lived 28 miles outside of that. <laughs> so my parents moved to Denahoto, Arizona to teach. I'm in Bellingham and uh, I'm 16. I'm reading, you know, like Carlos Castaneda. I don't know if Black, Black Elk Speaks is maybe out at that time. You know, Black, you know the book Black Elk Speaks? No, I know. It's about uh, uh, a Sioux Indian who, who fought at Bighorn. He was a medicine man. Oh, yeah. And everybody okay. was reading. Oh, this I is, know what that is. Yeah. It's like, this yeah. is where everybody's getting into, yeah. you know, well, this is people are, this is the time when people are starting Buddhism, Hinduism. This is all the hippies were, you know, becoming interested in Eastern spirituality. Yeah, this is about 1970. Native Americans. For you. Yeah, yeah. 1970. My brothers have left, um, uh, my brothers have moved to Palo Alto. They moved to a place called The Land, um, which was a big commune up on Skyline overlooking Palo Alto, up Page Mill Road. Joan is now living in a place called Struggle Mountain, which is a well-known place up on Page Mill Road. So my family, my brothers are all now up in the Bay Area, which right. gives me, well, which you'll see, totally makes a connection for me. Um, and my parents have now moved to Denahoto. I'm in Bellingham. I'm 16, and uh, I move. I, I when I'm done, I take my log cabin, and move to. I go to be with my parents. Yeah. And so I move. I drive to uh, Denahoto, and I have long hair at this point. And I'm um, so even when How I, long? you know, down way down, way before yeah. having no hair, way <laughs> down. And uh, uh, and so my I get to Denahoto, and I mean this is out in the middle of nowhere. And so the second day in Denahoto, I walk out into, I go out of the school compound, and I walk out, and there's a hogan out there, and I hear this, this, this chanting and this rattles, 
and I hear this, and I walk up to this hogan. I'm I'm curious person. I'm curious with everything, and I peek in. Inside that hogan are two old medicine men with hair bundles wrapped up, hair bundles, and in the middle of this hogan there was nothing but a sheepskin and this little boy, eight year old boy, with uh, sitting on the sheepskin with no shirt on, and these two medicine men in front of them with uh, their medicine bundles, and I looked in and I said, Oh, can I come in? And they didn't speak English. No, I'm sure not. But they said, oh, yeah, come in, come in. You know, I come in and I sat down, down. And there they were. They were healing this little boy, chanting and doing their thing. And then one Navajo medicine man comes out and goes outside the Hogan. And he has his bull roar. And he goes around it four times going, oh, 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 (laughs) with his bull roar. And I'm watching this as like, I'm not an America anymore. Yeah. I'm not an America. Right. And this is like, I'm in Navajo land. And um, so it was absolutely amazing. You know, here I am. Do you think you felt something at that moment? Well, at that moment, it was like, I just left the United States. I was yeah. in another country. And it was pretty amazing. Yeah. And because of that, and because I was just curious, and they, again, I they weren't, I was not your typical Belagana. Right. I was like, this is really early on. They didn't see a white guy with long hair really very often. Yeah, well, you're in Denahoza too, yeah, which is, I'm, there's, I mean, there's nothing out there's there. There's nothing in Denahoza. There's the yeah. Trading Post, which right. Walter Kennedy owned at that time, and then the school. Yeah. And then basically because of the Navajo culture, they're spread out versus everywhere. Pueblo. They're, yeah. You know, you wouldn't know, but it's a large community, but it's spread out everywhere. Yeah. Right. So anyway, I'm in Denahoza and I decided to stay there for quite a while because I just wanted to soak myself into the culture. And I started to go to sings. I invite, I asked people, can I come to sings? I went to ceremonies. I'd go to sings. I'd be the only Anglo or I'd bring my parents. And they only spoke Navajo. And they played like, they loved to gamble. They played gambling games. You know, mm-hmm. they, and this is things that they've been doing forever. And um, I really um, got into it. Um, that's where I really learned how to ride a horse. It was in Denahoto. Um, and um, I learned how to ride. And it was great. And they were natural born horse people i mean little kids are riding bareback and right. and uh you know we i would do midnight rides with navajos down on 160 with semis going right by us in the middle of the night with the full moon and, <laughs> and they live near the chinley wash and uh you know it, it, it was so from denahoto if you walk out our backyard and walk directly basically northwest mm-hmm. and you'd walk and keep walking through sand dunes and etc um uh, you finally get up to Coxcomb and you climb up and what on, on the very top is Monument Valley. Yeah. But you don't, no one gets to see that view. That's a view no one sees, yeah. but Navajos, because right. you're out and, you know. So that, that was my view of Nava, of Monument Valley. You can see uh, Mexican hat. You right. You can see the whole rim, uh, Ruby Ridge, you know, I mean, Garnet Ridge, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So um, I spent quite a bit of time there. There were times... There were times when, because I was a teenager there were, and I was with my parents, there was times when I thought this was the most, very interesting. There are other times where, oh, this is the most boring place in the world. I can't be here. This is too boring. Well, time changes there, for sure. Y- yeah, it it's, does. And it's very slow paced. Yes, that's right. And uh, so I really got into it. So, I, I'm here, so I'm a teenager when I'm really living with the Navajos. Yeah. My brother knew a yogi who was very, this yogi from Belgium, he was very good friends with a, a David Manung guy, Manungi, mm-hmm. who lived at Haute Villa. I don't know if you know that name, yeah, but I he did. he was sort of like one of the spokespeople for the Hopi. He used to tour and talk about Hopi philosophy. Right. So I went down to um, uh, 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 Tuba City and went to Mo and Kopi, and I saw my first bean dance in Mo and Kopi. Yeah. I went to Haute Villa because of this yogi, and I went to David because he knew David, and I went and met David, and super nice guy, his wife super nice, and they invited me, and they said, they just, it was late, and they, they said, well, well, stay with us, and they put me up in their home in Haute Villa, yeah. and I got to stay with him, and it was a really great thing. And, yeah, and you're and, like 17? Yeah, yeah, I'm 17, yeah. and I, was, I got to stay there, and again, how things, is so strange, like the painting, so um, I went and met him, and uh, I, I love the Hopi people. Hopi people are wonderful. And uh, very, you know, different culture than the Navajo. And the Navajo people are wonderful people. But from the outsiders, Navajos have a little bit of, if, once you get to know guarded. Navajos, they're guarded. Yeah. The Navajos have the most incredible sense of humor. Yeah, they're they the do. funniest people in the yeah. world. But if they know you, then they let the hair yeah. down. If they don't know you, they're yeah. not sure. Yeah, well, when, they, you know, they spent... Yeah. 
what three years in prison yeah four years yeah in i mean you know so <laughs> so especially if you're a belagon i can yeah, see why they, you, you know they're just they're not sure but once <laughs> i do know you yeah. they're incredible and, and the navajo people are fantastic and super smart at this point in time were you looking at native arts or jewelry or rugs so, or any of that stuff so uh well and so Actually, the very first thing I, and this is still when I was 17, the first thing I actually brought back to LA to sell were sheepskins. Because the Navos, I even did somewhere as cleaning the skins because they had, you know, how to right. hang them up. Right. I had mohair, goat skins, and sheepskins. I took them back to LA to try to sell some. But that just sort of fell out. Um, but and at this point, I have a lot of friends living in the Venice Canals, mm -hmm. which were sort of falling apart then. And I would bring my, truck my camper there why did you think that you could sell something like that well because uh people were you know um it was again from uh, indigenous people and people were looking for things uh, you know throw on their floor or on their beds right but you that. had an innate sense like oh i can buy and sell things yeah well i actually i was a little sort of an entrepreneur i mean i had my paper out when i was a little boy yeah i, I worked at the car wash when i was 11 or whatever um, I started building, uh, making my own uh, uh, sand ca uh, ice cast, uh, casted uh, candles mm -hmm. and selling them on Venice Boardwalk. When okay, I'm so 14. you... I'm already kind of an entrepreneur. So you have this natural kind of, I like to buy and sell. Yeah, and just for that, uh, yeah. I think you find that in all of us that deal in these arts that we have the sensibility of we like to buy things and sell them. Yeah, it just uh, gets me an entrepreneurial spirit or yeah. something. So also, you meet people, you know, it opens doors. I don't know. It's a yeah. commerce, traders. You and know, you're good at Coca -Pelli. it. Coca-Pelli. Yeah, and you're good you at know, it. Your story, we're all storytellers kind of a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So, so um, you try so already, to you try to sell the sheepskins, yeah, goats, goats. That know. didn't work so much. You come, yeah, and you go back to LA. Are you going back to go to college no, or school? So, this or? Is, so, so most people, I'm, I, um, so here I'm 17. I spend a lot of time on the reservation. I uh, go back and forth to Venice. Um, and then I met this fellow who was making this incredible documentary. He was interviewing the, all these politicians and spiritual leaders. He interviewed the Dalai Lama, the mm. Cardinal Rye of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. He interviewed Jimi Hendrix. And, was this 1970? Uh, around 1970, yes. Yeah. And he made this documentary, and he was running out of money. And I knew a woman who was very wealthy, and he needed a hundred grand to finish the film. And I got this money for him. Hmm. And I had just turned eighteen, and um, and so most kids at eighteen are going to start go to college somewhere. And um, and I was st already st uh, studying Eastern philosophies, and I was interested in a certain guru and. So he gave me a ticket to Del New Delhi, India, mm. and um, and he said meet me there, and because he was going to make his movie, and I, I told my parents I'm I'm going to go to India, and so I just turned 18 and I got on a plane to go to India. On the plane I was sitting with this man, and he said, well where are you going? I said, well I'm going to New Delhi, India. He says, where are you going there? And I said, I don't know. I'm going to meet this <laughs> That's guy. A huge place. And I'm sitting next to this guy, and so he's, and he said, and so when I land in New Delhi, he said, he said where are you going? I said, I don't know. So he says, well come with me. I think he was the son of Kodak. And so he goes and takes me to this place called, uh, 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 God, what's the name? Uh, um, uh, it was a Buddhist monastery and a youth hostel, yeah. Ashoka Vihara. Uh -huh. And it was just near Quinta Minar, which is this giant tower that was built by the Mughals, one of the largest iron tower in the history at that point in the world. And he took me to the Ashoka Vihara where Bunty the monk lived. And Bunty the monk was the right-hand advisor to the king of Cambodia. And the Indian government gave him this Prince's Walking Garden, built by the Mughals. Mm -hmm. And uh, this man uh, who brought me there gave Bunty a VW van, and it was a youth hostel. So all these p kids my age were traveling, all from Australia, from Europe, right. America, were all going there, staying there. It was the scene. It was going on. It was right. the scene. And, uh, and it was a Buddhist monastery that Bunty lived and the government gave to him. So I ended up living there, and I, ha I lived in an 800-year-old room built by the Mughals, and um, it was just outside Delhi at this point, and all these archaeological ruins. And, and uh, at this point, it was just outside of Delhi. Now it's an archaeological site that there's building uh, communities all around it. And he had this VW van my, uh, this fellow gave him. And so I ended up being kind of his chauffeur because he didn't drive. He's like 80 years old. Right. And he was so great. He was an amazing person. And he, he um, so I, I did things like I took him, I drove him, and driving in Delhi is wild. I can and, only imagine. Uh, yeah. And so I took him. He knew the president but of India. But you were from L.A. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> so I took him. I met the president of India. Wow. I was in a room. I was 10 feet from Indra Gandhi. Yeah. So I, get to, I met the president, and I, mean, I got to do all these things. 
Uh, it was really fascinating. Did the documentary film guy? You know what? Show I never up, met. I never found him. I never. He we just <laughs> missed each other. So, I, but this was my now my headquarters. I'm in India. I had a four month visa, and I told. I wrote back to my parents. I said, you know, I, I can't come home. I'm, I'm gonna let my visa just drop. I can't come home. This is I, my mind was blown. This is India is so far from West yeah. Coast for a white kid, middle class white kid from L.A. I was as far away as that you can be, and I, I was like, it was like I was a kid in a candy shop. I was like, I was like in Disneyland. How does that compare to the Navajo Nation, which you also said this isn't really yeah, America? Totally different. And I'll tell you a country I go to that has a, that's kind of comparable. Yeah. But India, because there's so many people there, and the culture's so old, and the Hindu culture, and also uh, India is the second largest Muslim population in the world. Which yeah. People don't know that. Were the Beatles at all affecting you? Because, uh, I mean, they're doing that kind of yeah, stuff Yeah, everybody, now. everyone's running around. I, I uh, not really affect me, but we're all kind of doing it at the same time. Yeah, I mean. But I was pretty young. I, everyone was a little bit older than me. Mm. Uh, just sort of like the Native American art business, I, I, when I was just got into it, I was pretty young. I was 23 years old. And right. Most everyone was a little bit older than me. I probably the only, I was talking with Kim Martinell about, probably the only youngest person at that point was maybe Kim. Yeah, you know. Bad. But um, I'm. Uh, but back to India, I got. I um, I traveled on train. I traveled like through Rajasthan. There's castles. Mm. I went to Ajanta and Lora Caves where they have these, you know, 150 foot yard uh, Buddhas carved in the sides of mountains. Right. I went to Bombay. I went to Goa. I lived on a houseboat on the Ganges in uh, Benares, which is the mm -hmm. Narsi. How did that happen? Oh, it's incredible. Well, you know, I went to uh, uh, Benares and I lived in a children's orphanage for a little while, just staying there. Yeah. You know, um, being a, Amer a white guy from America opens up so many doors. Yeah. And uh, then I went to this houseboat. So probably someone was living on Probably I rented it for a couple of rupees a day. And I lived literally on the Ganges next to the Ghats where they had the, the where they're burning the bodies. Right. And, the, and these old, and the temples everywhere. I mean, incredible temples. And you'd walk down, you know, 200 yards of steps and, the le and leapers, lepers everywhere. People, I mean, they come there to die. It's their yeah. holy city. Yeah. And, you know, some, you walk down the stairs and there's a hundred lepers there. You're, you're, you know, right next to them. So these are all the things I'm being exposed to. Um, I traveled all over India. Then I went to Nepal. Um, I lived in Kathmandu and the temples. I went to uh, uh, the Annapurna Range and I trekked through the Himalayas. Um, Were you, you know, looking for something? Searching well, for Well, you yourself? know, so all of us, I lived, I went and I sat, I met Sai Baba, who was a guru. I was Guru Maharaji, who was a little teen, was the young guru. I was in riots in India. I mean, I saw just so many different things. But and, was it a spiritual walkabout? Yeah, basically. Where, you know, and I, t I was more than that because it was just an education. Instead of yeah. being going to San Marcos City College, I was going to the College of the World. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I like, I, you know, I mean, I sat and studied and, you know, I was learning things and learning the, you know, I ran out of money when I was living in Delhi, I ran out of money. I was selling used books on the Kanat Circus, you know, you know, uh, <laughs> what, you what know. kind of books were these? In, no, in no, they were, you know, just American books. They were books? English books that the Indians wanted to buy them, you yeah. know, you know, 10, 20 cents. And, um, you know, but my parents would send me a hundred dollars every once in a while and that, and you can, that was 1300 rupees. And I learned how to have dinner on two, two rupees, and, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, what's, your parents, I really, what's your parents think of this? I think, um, you know, like any parents, they're really concerned about I had two older brothers. So they were, by the time I was ready to go, they were already like, okay, he's, you know, because, yeah. you know, the first son, you know, like, you got to be careful. Right. You know, the binky story, you know. Yeah, I know the whole thing. Okay, you know, the binky story. Yeah. So, you know, the last one, they just stick it back in the mouth. So, yeah. but they, I had their blessings, which made me feel uh, good. And uh, so, you know, I was able to... Um, feel comfortable and they'd send me money you know they'd send me you know not a lot but i knew how to survive yeah on a little yeah and i ever ate like indians you know i you know i you know i ate their food yeah yeah i got sick there you know i i mean i'm sure but you know it it really influenced my life and i must say one of the things that influenced me is um you know um everything's so relative and the thing that you learn in life is there's always someone richer than you and poorer than you yeah and when you live in a country like india for a while you know where we live, our problems. Most of them, not that they, not that they're not real, but you know, some of them are such first world problems. Right. I, my third car just broke down. I'm, you know, uh, you know, it's like, you know, really, your third car just broke down. You know, it's like, give me a break. You know, people are yeah. like, you know, so. 
So I went to Nepal, I came back to India, yeah. my visa ran out, the Bangladesh war was going on. I must tell you, India, like I went to the Taj Mahal, unbelievable, mm. unbelievable. You know, just the architecture there. I've been to, I went to the, where Buddha was born. I was, uh, the war was an interesting time being there. Um, my visa ran out, the Indian government, um, we support Pakistan during that war, and the Indian government looked at me, they said, well, you know what, we're gonna throw you in jail, your visa ran out. They said, you have two weeks, get out of America, <laughs> out of India, right. or you have two weeks, we're gonna throw you in jail. So, boom. I'm on a train to Pakistan, I get to Pakistan, I go through Pakistan, I go to Peshawar, which is uh, near the border of Afghanistan, amazing city. Oh, this is like being, like in an, again, in another century. Right. I go through the Khyber Pass, I get to Kabul, I stay in Kabul for quite a while, I hung out in Kabul, then I go out into, uh, I go out into the Hindu Kush, I go to Bandamir, which is the giant Buddhas, mm -hmm. and with the Taliban blew up, yeah. and that was, I believe it's the furthest West Buddhism went, was there, or in parts of Afghanistan, and there are caves where the monks built the, the Mildat uh, Buddha, you know, it was 180 feet in this right. canyon, unbelievable. And you can go through these caves, and I had like this 12-inch wide plank that you can walk across with a 180-foot drop, cross, and I, you can go out onto the head of the Buddha, which I did. Yeah. And the Buddha head must have been diameter 30 feet. Yeah. I mean, it was incredible. It was a <laughs> world, you know, right. historic site. And um, so, and I rode ho horses out because I knew how to ride. I rode ho horses out in the Hindu Kush. And it was like being truly in the 12th century. And that's why I, about Navajo land, I was in the 12th century. And um, they still, they, the, the wheat fields, they grow it and they had the, the you know, size. And they had wooden, uh, I mean, they had stone um, grinders Motors, yeah. that, that they would do with rivers. And um, I'll tell you, it, I think at that point, I think Afghanistan must have been the third poorest country in the world. Mm. And you knew it. But I always felt very safe, and people are very gracious. I think, I mean, actually sometimes the very poorest people in the world are most gracious people. And there are places, I think there were places where my life probably was in my hands, but if you didn't know it, you, yeah, you're you just went through it. You know? Yeah, you're like, you're, young, you're, you you're 19, know. right? So, yeah, I'm, you know. So how long do you stay on this walkabout before you so, head back? So I'm in Afghanistan, I leave Afghanistan, I go to Uriah, and, and again, Afghanistan was very amazing place. Yeah, I've heard that. And um, and everyone's traveling, you know, and you bump into people everywhere, too. That's the other thing. So I leave Afghanistan, I get to Turkey, and the other thing I was doing on this trip, I went, I wanted to see the sights, you know. I was a tourist, so, you know, you go to the, um, you know, in Istanbul, you know, you go to the famous Blue Mosque, you know, you do all that stuff. I go fly into Israel. Uh, because I was sick from India, I went to a kibbutz and worked on a kibbutz, um, which was really great, right on the Mediterranean-Lebanese border. I became a farmer, um, you know, because they farmed, you know, and I got healthy. I lived on this kibbutz. I did the avocado orchards, the turkeys, wash pots, pans, whatever. Did you at this point think maybe this is what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay in Israel, be no. a farmer? Or? No, uh, no, I was just trying to do experiences from the kibbutz. I went, uh, I went to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and I, I, and I actually, um, because again, of India, you know, everyone's spiritually seeking. So I, li I ended up living on Mount Zion in Jerusalem uh, in, a, again, another 800-year-old room built over King David's tomb on Mount Zion, surrounded by graveyards, and there was a yeshiva there, and I went and studied the Talmud there. Hmm. And I used to go from uh, Jerusalem uh, down to, into the Dead Sea and go into the caves in the Dead Sea, and you'd go there and fast in the case. I mean, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's wild. Then, I mean, this is uh, this is kind of pre a lot of problems. So uh, I used to run around in the old city Jerusalem at 2 a.m. in the morning. You would just run around in the old right. city and nothing happened to you. You know, I was, again, I was 19 years and old. And this is around like 71, 19, two? Yes, 1972. Yeah. Because I left in 70. Because the Vietnam War is kind of ending yeah, at this end, time. Yeah, so Vietnam sort of ending. So we at this still time. had some issues going on in yes, this country. Yes, we did. And so I lived in Israel for almost a year. Fantastic. I leave Israel. I hitchhike across Europe. Um, I go to Greece. Yeah, I want to see the Acropolis. Right. I scootered around Corfu, went to Italy, which I, I absolutely love. Go to Rome, St. Peter's. You know, I want to see. I go to right. Florence. I hitchhike through the uh, Alps, you know. I go to Paris, you know, I, I go to the museums. You want to see the museums. I see French Impressionist paintings at the Railroad right. Museum, Louvre. I go to Amsterdam. I was see the seeing, Van Gogh Museum. Was seeing all this art, do you think it changed how you were starting to interpret 
interpret the world and your own I who you are. I think that I'm exposed. I'm just being exposed to a yeah, lot Yeah, I mean, because I go back to these paintings when you're six that yeah. you get, you know, that yeah. are so pivotal in your life. Yeah. And you're not, now you're seeing all these great works of art. Yeah. If that's soaking in, you're 20 years I old. Think, I think, you know, I'm just, you know, I mean, I guess I'm curious enough to want to look at art and then I'm seeing the best of the yeah. best. Well, not everybody wants to look at art. Some no. people are at 20 or want to look at girls. Yeah. Well, I noticed the girls looking at me when I seen the art, which was real amazing. <laughs> <laughs> They're not checking me out. Well, I'm checking the art. I was like, so uh, anyway, but that's true. Uh, so um, I spent my time in Europe. I come back to them. America. I land into the United States. And why States. did you come back? Uh, I was gone for two years. I wanted to see my family. Okay, so you there know. was a point. You've done your walk. Yeah, I've about. been two years. I've been on the road. And you've lived in Israel. You've cleaned pans yeah, I've and done turkeys all this stuff. and yeah. sold books on the side of yeah. the road. And you've done a lot. Yeah. You've seen a lot. Yeah, you've I met Bunty the Monkey in Amsterdam, by the way. I didn't know it, but there he was in Amsterdam. <laughs> I just went, Jonathan Hill. You know, Jonathan Hill lives in Santa Fe. Not this John Hill in yeah. Phoenix. Jonathan Hill, do you know Jonathan? I don't think I do. Anyway, Jonathan, I met him in New Delhi. And then we see each other 30 years later. Fabulous musician, too. Really good good musician. And so you come back and you're so to see I, your folks and to just maybe I'll find you, your past. Because yeah. you're right, you're 20 now, I'm right? I'm 20 years old. I'll tell you a story. I wasn't going to share it with you, but you brought out the earlier parts, I will. Yeah. I come back into America, so you have to come back and marry. You go through customs. Right. I'm on the East Coast, um, you know, went to... Played around a little bit. Got back to Denahotso. I'm in America for two weeks. And there's a knock on the door. I open the door. And two men in suits, white socks and black shoes, look at me and say, are you Philip Garraway? And I said, yes. And they open up. Hi, we're the FBI. <laughs> and I said, oh, wow. Okay. In Denahotso. In Denahotso. 100 miles in Denahotso, you understand that we went shopping. We, when we went shopping, we went to Farmington, New Mexico, or Cortez, yeah, Colorado. No, I mean, it's, 100 miles I to get go shopping. It. You're out in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. Hi, we're the FBI. I said, oh, okay. And, well, we're here because you didn't register for the draft. Because I was against the war. Yes. And I would have been, went to prison. I would have. but And I didn't leave the country to escape jail. or I went to travel. Right. And I was gone for two years, and I'm 20 years old, and they came, and they put handcuffs and foot chains on me. My parents, they're driving out in their dark Plymouth or whatever, out of Denahotel. So my parents are watching this, and they take me to Tuba City, and I go into a drunk, they put me in the drunk tank in Tuba City that night. Oh, yeah, that must have been I spent the night in the drunk tank in Tuba City. Next day, they drove me to a Flagstaff Maximum County Jail. I spent a week in the jail there. My brother, who lives now in Palo Alto, it was getting married that weekend. They drove me down to Phoenix to the federal building on Friday. Five minutes before five on Friday night, um, they put me in front of the judge. And um, the judge said, uh, um, and this is towards the end of the war. And I think he, his children might have been in the military. Yeah. I think he was very conscious of things were not going well. Yeah. And he said to me, he said, will you register for the draft? And I, it was Friday before, right before the weekend. And, um, and my brother was getting married that weekend. And I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll register. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to make any point at that point because it was the end of the war. Right. And, uh, and so I got out, spent the night. Next morning my, at my mother's friend's house, she drove me to the airport. I flew to Oakland. I don't know how, I got on a helicopter, flew across the bay on a helicopter and made it to my brother's wedding in mm. Palo Alto. <laughs> so here's my brothers in Palo Alto. Um, they're very involved. Um, I, I'm 20 years old and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so and, um, we, we were involved in the Bay Area. And my, brother, my middle brother was friends with a man named George Holman, who was the president of the California Bee Association. He loved, lived on Los Caneros Road on the old Sonoma Highway right outside of Napa mm -hmm. on a 10 acres. And he was one of the foremost beekeepers in California, and he had 2,000 colonies of bees. And I don't know if you know this story or not. No. So um, I'm 20, and I didn't know what to do, and I love farming, and I think farmers are incredible. So I, he became, I, be, I became his apprentice. Mm. And he had a room above the garage where I can live, and they fed me. And I worked with him for one year as his apprentice as a beekeeper. Mm. And we ran 2,000 colonies, and we specialized in um, royal jelly. That's what we specialized in. And we had big, giant flatbed trucks, 
and we would load the, uh, at night 200 hives, and at 2 a.m. in the morning, we would drive out into the San Joaquin Valley because you get paid to pollinate, you know, the almond right. orchards or the alfalfa. So the two places you take your bees is to go get poll- to pollinate and get paid or to groves where there's nectar flowing, like uh, eucalyptus groves mm-hmm. or wild buckwheat. Right. And so we would take these beehives 200 at a time at sunrise, unload them, stack them, you know, hives that are two or three feet high, weighing 150 pounds with tit thousands of bees. And um, I did that for a year, and we worked the San Joaquin Central Sacramento Valley. And it was an incredible, it was boot camp for a 20-year-old. Yeah. And when you're in a bee suit and it's 110 degrees in a, a, a prairie with 100,000 bees and you squish a few and they all talk to each other and they, you can, they, there's a scent that comes out and it's 9 o'clock in the morning and it's 100 degrees and, you know, they're all talking to each other and you just killed one. It's like, you know it. And it's like, okay, we're going to leave now. And we just, we get out of there. Anyway, so I became, I was a beekeeper for a year and it truly was boot camp. They were very religious people. They were Christians, but really great people. And they took me in and um, uh, it was a great experience. So I did that for a year. What do you think you learned from that? Um, the hard work, hard. And I also truly were appreciating farmers. Yeah. People, you know, they go to the market and they buy their food. And you go to the market and there's 30 types of cereal on the shelves and, you know, right. You know, like people in India, you know, I mean, you know, you, if you drop someone from Afghanistan into one of our markets, they wouldn't know what to think. Yeah. We have such abundance here, you know. So um, I, I learned, um, also, you, uh, um, you know, I, I love nature. And if you're being a beekeeper, you know, you're, you're, you're watching the sunrise while you're driving the bees somewhere. Or, you know, you're in orchards. You're yeah. in uh, almond orchards that are in full bloom. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. Right. And the far and farmers are just, you know, they're just all, they're real farmers. Yeah, I mean, of course. You know, real farmers. Oh, I know. You know. I grew up around them. Okay. Yeah. And you grew up in Roswell, New Mexico? Portales. Yeah. Uh, where? Portales. Uh-huh. Which is down in that area? Yeah, it's east of Roswell. Okay. And yeah. your parents, what kind of work did your folks do? They were uh, scientists. Scientists? Research scientists. Yeah. And did, would they work like at um, White Sands or something? No, they worked at Eastern in Portales. Uh-huh. My dad was an entomologist, ichthyologist. My mom was a botanist and oh. an ichthyologist. Okay. Yep, so, so they did research. And then that kind of opened the doors to medicine to you to kind of engine? Mm, no, not really. I mean, yeah, I was. I did science, but... You know, they would have rather me be a scientist than a physician. Yeah, and then uh, was that your first work being a doctor? Was that your w- w- was? I mean, besides probably you did your well, paper there, route. And there all. was there was lots of those, but we won't go into them because yeah. I want to know about you. But okay. yes, I did. We'll go back to you though. Yeah, but yes, no, I had lots of different yeah. jobs. I, did, sure. I always worked. Well, you know, the good thing is the more things you do, I try to tell this to my son. Just the better it is, yeah, the no, more rounded true. you are. Just no, and you. you know. I mean, we can look at all these things you've already done, yeah. and you're only 21. Yeah. It just makes your life richer. <laughs> and I think it's really important and really, I've always believed this, and I truly believe this, and we would have less problems in this world, and I've written a few songs about it. You have to walk in other people's shoes. Yeah. If you do that, you learn empathy when you walk in someone else's shoes. Yeah, that you is true. You have to do that. Yeah, no, it is true. Yeah. You know. The more you can recognize those things, moments when they happen, the better you are as a human. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing um, that I think right now, because of we're in, I think that the planet's in a little bit of shock overload, is one of the things that we you need to do to yourself, and I think you need to do it to your loved ones and even strangers, is be nurturing. Yeah. I think it's very important right now. I, I'm my worst critic. I do I make a mistake. I, we're human. I beat myself up, and it's like you have to nur- be nurturing. Yeah, you 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 have to do that, and particularly to the loved ones that you have, you people have to know that. And if you do that, you don't know how much that might help someone. Yeah, it can be life changing. Yes, it can be literally, yeah. and you don't know it, but it yeah. Can well, be. you've had a few of these examples already. Yeah, that yeah, have, the tragedies and, uh, and things that have come through your life too. That have you know, the, yeah, from a nurturing bee farmer. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of shows you what. Life can be well. It's like animals. I love animals. You know, anybody. You know, you heard an animal now, but you know, you know, you better watch out. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I'm. I I, I was a beekeeper, and I thought I'd go back to. I went back to dental hold. So, I'll take one drink because now here, now it's kind of now full circle where how I start the Indian business. Yeah. Okay. So you're 21. You've done all this stuff. And you go back to see your folks. And do you have an idea of what you're going to do, or is it so just I a go, visit? I'm in and out all the time. 
I don't know how I'm not sure.